organization she started that lifts individuals out of poverty through vocational training, soft skills, apprenticeship opportunities, and mentorship programs. Sejal is dedicated to her passion of eradicating poverty and is always paying it forward in her community. In addition, Sejal is president and founder of the Young Entrepreneurs Club and Learn Serve Ambassador, guiding the youth to be change agents and an editor of the school newspaper. She is also on the advisory board of Generation Z, an organization committed to helping the youth to take control of their future. Sejal encourages others to find ways to send the elevator back down and pay it forward in their own way. Please join me in welcoming Sejal Catherine McKee. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. By show of hands, how many of you have ever seen a Tumblr post before? Yeah, it looks like a lot of you have. So then I'm sure you all have seen this post. And it reads, I hate Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and half of Fridays. By, uh, judging by the looks in the audience, I think a lot of you can relate to this in some of our rougher weeks. Yeah? And so, this post used to be my favorite post until I had a self-transformation that forever changed my outlook on life to where now this is my new favorite post. And it reads, I made a difference on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and half of Friday. Some of you may be thinking, how is this possible? How could someone go from hating every day to making a difference every day? And I want to explain to you the transformation that I experienced that changed my mindset so that hopefully you too can experience this change in mindset. So a few months ago, I got a call from the National League of Cities asking me to be the keynote speaker at this year's conference. And to talk about the organization that I started, The Elevator Project, the list of financially disadvantaged out of poverty through different forms of education. And I thought, rather than just talk to you all about The Elevator Project, that I would speak to you and share with you the transformation that I experienced that unleashed the power within me, so that you too can unleash the power within you. The three critical self-transformations that I experienced are the awakening, the change, and the impact. The first transformation that I experienced was the awakening. Do you know what? 70% of our youth is spent in the classroom doing homework, playing sports, and being online. A combined total of about 25,000 hours is spent doing school-related activities. And we're told what we have to do, and we're told how we have to do it. And it turns into this rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat cycle. And occasionally we'll get some social time and some vacation peppered in, but we all know that's never enough. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you all about is that society tells us that we should think from the outside in. We must first understand what we do and how we do it. But most of us will never get to the center and understand our why, and understand our purpose, and understand our cause. There are some people that live their entire life without getting to the middle and understanding their why. But I ask you, what if we were able to invert this circle of belief to where first we were able to understand our purpose and our cause and our why, Think about how much easier it would be to do what we have to do and know how we have to do it. Think about how much more of a value we would put on the education that we are so blessed to have. And think about how much easier it would be, once we knew our why, to wake up early in the morning and go to school. And so, by flipping this circle of belief, a lot of us will, be first, will first be able to understand our purpose and our cause. And so, what I want to share with you is the moment that I realized my purpose, and my cause, and my why. I like to call it my awakening moment. And it starts 
with me being dragged to a soup kitchen in D.C. in 2012. Early one morning, my dad woke me up and said, we're going to a soup kitchen. And I was not having it. I had never been, and so early in the morning, I'd rather just sleep. But when I get there, I get donned in this fishnet hair, hair cap and a green apron and gloves to my elbows. And I'm just thinking, this is, this is fantastic. And so the volunteer manager told me to take my spot in the line, and I quickly peered out the window, and I saw a line of the impoverished and the hungry that seemed to stretch for miles. And the only thought that crossed my head at that moment was, this is going to be a long day. I can't wait for it to be over. And so when they opened the doors and started letting people in, I put my head down, so I wouldn't make eye contact with them, and they just started filing through the line, and I was serving them food, just like I was told, was told to do. But when everyone was done, which seemed like hundreds of people, I picked my head up, and someone caught my eye. A man named Juan and his family were sitting not too far away from where I was standing, and something about them drew me in, to where I felt like I needed to introduce myself. So I simply walked over and I sat down at the table right across from them and I said, Hi, my name is Angel. And they introduced themselves individually. But immediately, Juan started sharing the struggles of living in poverty with me. He just started pouring out to me his entire life story of living in poverty. He shared that at every, that at every door he knocked, he was rejected. And at every job opportunity he applied, he was rejected. And in every other opportunity he had to lift his family out of poverty, he was rejected. And the look in his eyes was that of hopelessness. And the look in his family's eyes was that of hopelessness. And I could just see the weight on his shoulders was so immense. And as he was sharing his story with me, tears trickled down his face. And it was in that moment that I realized I have to do something about it. I have to go home and try and understand what he was sharing with me. And one of the most important things he shared with me was that the reason why he felt he couldn't get a well-waging job opportunity is because the impoverished are looking for well-waging job opportunities. And the well-waging job opportunities are looking for potential employees that have education and skill attainment. But the gap exists in that the impoverished are unable to get the education and the skill attainment sometimes because they can't afford it. They're concerned with issues like putting food on their children's plates and finding a home to stay in. And so, hearing about this gap, I was moved to do research. I had to understand the plight of poverty. And I, I had to understand what this gap was and to fully understand it. These are some of the facts that I had. So, does anyone know what country has the largest child poverty rates in all the industrialized world? Just start calling it out if you think you know. It is. The United States has the largest child poverty rates in all of the industrialized world. Does anyone have a guess for how many people are living in poverty? Just call it out. Not 30 million, not 10 million. Anyone say it? Keep going. It's 46.7 million people. 46.7 million people are living in poverty in the United States. So you would have a guess for one out of how many children are living in poverty? One, not one of three. Anyone? It's one out of five. Twenty percent of our youth is living in poverty. And if all those in poverty were gathered in one state, that state would be ranked the number one largest state among all 50. Does anyone have a guess for what the federal government puts the poverty threshold at for a family of four? Anyone? Not 6000 not 30000 It's $24,500 is what the poverty threshold is placed at for a family of four. But the really interesting fact that I found out is that researchers estimate that in order to meet basic needs for a family of four, they actually require $46,000. Almost two times what the federal government is putting the poverty threshold out. And so, 
hearing these facts and learning about them, I was alarmed because I had no idea that poverty existed in my country at this rate. At this alarming rate, the United States is so heavily affected by poverty, and I had no idea at this time. And so I was shocked by the national numbers, but I was even more shocked by the numbers in my state, and by the numbers in my community, and even by the numbers happening right outside my backyard. So these are the top 10 states with the highest poverty rate. And if you're looking at these numbers and you think, well, my state isn't on there, it's not my problem, it's only, it only exists on a national level for me, then you're wrong, because there is not one state that isn't affected by poverty on an alarming scale. On average, 15% of all people in the United States are living in poverty. So, imagine a world in which, in which we were able to say, poverty will not exist, not in my backyard, not any backyard, and not in my community, not any community, and not in my state, and not any state. In not my country, but not any country will have to live in poverty any longer. So this was my awakening. I realized that my purpose was to eradicate poverty and do everything I could to contribute towards helping with families out of poverty. So that belief that I could do this turned into action. And I knew I had to do something about it. I knew I had to be a change agent, and that is my second transformation, was to be the change agent. So my beliefs turned into my actions, and my actions yielded results. And the results only reinforced my belief that I could do this. And so, in this instance, I believed I could help lift Juan and his family out of poverty. That was my belief. And I drove it into action using four steps. And those four steps yielded the ultimate result to where Juan was able to live a life out of poverty for the first time ever. So allow me to share with you the four steps that yielded the ultimate result. The first belief that I had was that Juan needed hard skills training. So I took that belief and I drove it into action. And I had a fundraiser that would help support Juan in his vocational training efforts. And that action yielded a result. Juan received a certification and an electrical license. That was the result. And the second step of action I took was that I believed Juan also needed soft skills because I found that about 70% of employers use soft skills as just as important as certification and hard skills. It's not more important. So that was my belief, that he needed soft skills. And I drove it into action. I composed all this research and I comprised with a comprehensive curriculum that had all the soft skills in there, such as interpersonal skills, work ethic, resume writing. And that was the action. And the result was that Juan not only had hard skills now, he had a mastery of soft skills. And the third step of action I took was that I believed that in addition to hard skills and soft skills, one needed skill attainment, which is what employers are looking for. So I took that and I began to call every electrician that I've ever heard of, ever known, until one offered to take one under his wing and mentor him. And from that action yielded a result, which was that one was able to have not only hard skills and soft skills, but also in field training, in hard, in, uh, in, um, hard skills, soft skills, and hands-on training. And the final step was that I believed that Juan had every form of education necessary to lift him and his family out of poverty. That was my belief. So he took it to action. He began to apply to well-wage and job opportunities that had previously rejected him. And it yielded the ultimate result. Juan secured a full-time job paying him $52,000 ben with benefits. And he became a full-time electrician with the potential to master and make even more. So for the first time in his life, he was living a life out of poverty. 
And so, the awakening, which is the why and purpose and the cause, take that and you couple it with being the change agent. And it yields the impact. For me, I believed that my purpose was to end poverty. And so I did something about it, and I helped lift one and his family out of poverty. And that yielded a result in an impact. And the impact was that I launched my organization, The Elevator Project, in 2012. And so far, I've lifted several families out of poverty, just like ones, through a proven system that I developed. And it's ended poverty for several families. This is now the elevator project. The impact. So, participants start at the ground floor where they apply to be in the program, and we have an interview process with them in which we map out what their elevator ride is going to consist of. And the ride itself comprises of four floors. The first floor is the apprenticeship program, where participants receive hands on and in field training as wanted. The second floor is hard skills, vocational training, and they receive hard skills. And the third floor is a, is a soft skills floor where participants receive a mastery in soft skills. And the fourth floor is a job placement floor where participants themselves learn how to apply for a sustaining, well wage and job opportunity. And the final floor, the rooftop, is where graduates of the elevator project that have secured a well wage and job opportunity have the opportunity to send the elevator back down and mentor someone entering the program. All of our graduates foster the belief that if you're lucky enough to do well, it is your responsibility to send the elevator back down. And so, find, and so in order to unleash the power within you, I challenge you to find your why. Understand your purpose and your cause. And then do something about it. Take some action. Be a change maker. And then it'll yield an impact. Where many of you will be able to tackle the world's problems. You know, many people, they underestimate the power of our youth. But I believe that we should capitalize on it now. And do what we can to tackle these world problems. So with that, I leave you with one final thought. And that is... Why live an ordinary life when you can live an extraordinary life? Thank you.
people that have been there to support me throughout the entire process and are still there to support me. So I have a lot of support and I, and I always hear have, uh, I always have like um, youth and other people trying to get involved as well. So the support is outstanding. No, we're in the process of a 5 right now. So what was it? It's a long process. Sure. Yeah, so we had private and public uh, corporations donate. Um, on a private scale, there's just people that are inspired by the project and want to donate. And then on a uh, public corporation scale, there are companies that really believe in the message and will also donate. There's also like prizes out there, like the Peace First Prize that I was a finalist for. They give huge grants, like $20,000 grants that really would help progress a project like this as well. Hi, my name is Nadia. I'm part of the Lincoln Council for Mary Florida. I love the project. Um, I had a question. How do you um, give the hard skills or hard skills to people who are here? Sure. So the hard skills are gone through a vocational training school, and that's where the fundraising comes in to send them to a school that we have, um, depending on their location. And then the soft skills are largely taught by me. I comprise a huge curriculum with the help of my advisory board, um, so that participants are able to master the soft skills. Thank you. Sure, so it really depends on the person themselves. So the apprenticeship opportunity um, will be that very in the, in the um, process. So, um, for example, we had a participant that really loved his infield training opportunity, which eventually turned into a, a full time job. But the vocational training schools can go on from anywhere like three to six and seven months. So, um, it really depends on what the person wants to pursue. I mean, some trades are harder to um, learn about than others. So. Depends on the core side. I have one on the table coming. I'm just wondering what are the um, the specifically what are the hardest skills? Sure. So hard skills are vocational training. Um, so the vocational training provides, and it's an opportunity for participants to get a certification. And soft skills are. Uh, Things like things that'll prepare them that you can't necessarily get a certification in, such as work ethic, interpersonal skill, uh, interview training, resume writing. There's a plethora of them, but those are generally what hard skills, soft skills comprise of. Uh, hi, Dennis Vincenzo from Los Angeles. Um, I'm wondering if you could just have a question because you were talking about how you ended up contacting these people that you knew. Um, these contacts that you had, um, were they there already there for you, or did you find ways to actually? I mean, for, for Juan, I literally grabbed a yellow book and flipped through the, like, the electrician session and just started calling them all. I was really co-calling for that process. But now I think we've developed a good network in a lot of the trades where I know, you know who to go to and the companies are very supportive of this entire organization. So now I have one. But at the time, I really just pulled out a yellow book and started calling everyone. Are there any other jobs that can help specifically train people? Sure. So we have um, people do electrical, construction management, hairdressing, um, nursing, which takes a little bit longer. Um, I mean, there's a wide, wide variety of hard skills opportunities and also trades for the path. And it's really up to them. Whatever they want to do, um, we're very open to finding the right things for them. Um, did you get an opportunity to pursue a four-year degree, or is it just something in like choice of degrees? Sure. So, for example, um, there's a participant named Junior, and he came into the program with the intention to go all the way to the rooftop. And after he finished his infield training opportunity, he got a scholarship at Old Dominion University. We have a lot of participants that are just individuals. Um, it, it's open to everyone. The process works the same, no matter what the size of your family is. My name is Kwame Tiagi. I'm a marriage and council member from Tampa. And I was wondering, what are what is the success rate of the program that you have? Yeah, we have a 100% success rate. All of our participants are able to secure a well-wage and job opportunity that will pay them out of poverty.
the process where you figure out what the person wants to go into at the very beginning? Yeah, so on our ground floor, the application itself um, requires participants to put in what their field of interest would be. So it, once again, it's really up to whatever the participant wants to do. Um, I like to call us the dream achievers for them. So we're not going to, I mean, whatever they want to do, I want to help them achieve their dream and achieve their purpose. Hi, my name is Ariadne from the Fairmark Department. Um, how does the application process? Let's say you have like a huge mass of people that are interested in the program. How do you decide who? Right, and that's one of the hardest things that I have to do um, at the Elevator Project. Is we get a lot of applications, and because of the funding restriction, um, I can only take a certain amount, and it, and it ends up being need based. So um, they indicate their uh, income bracket and. <coughs> first six through. If we have to cut um, through the application process, um, it'll usually be from uh, from a need base as compared to the other participants. And also, um, we sit down with every one of the, almost every one of the applicants and go through the interview process and based on that, that's how the selection is. Is there any more questions? Yeah, I I'm curious to know if you have like an age limit or like an age bracket because you know there are some teen moms or like some children who live in Boston or like, whatever and their parents want to provide for them. So I was just curious to know if it's open Yeah, no, there's no age restriction. Um, we had a participant that was 17 years old and he had to drop out of school and so he worked with us and Hello, my name is DeAndre from the Federal Community Council. And um, my question for you is now that you have a fantastic program and everything, what are your goals and stuff now? Uh, what is your plan? Thank you. Um, my purpose hasn't changed. My purpose is still to try to eradicate poverty for everyone. And so my goals now are to take this to a national level. And and I'm helping a lot of people that are in the Washington metropolitan area, but to take it to a national scale is my ultimate goal. Hi, I'm Lewis from the Bridge and Buzz Board. Um, my question for you is, uh, how did you initially like, um, get the applicants to apply for your program if they didn't know about it? Sure, so I've been to uh, the National Poverty Conference in D.C. Um, I got a lot of applicants from there. It's a lot of like, uh, one person knows and then passes it on to the next and the application gets around. We've never had like a shortage of applicants uh, for the program and because of the funding restriction we have a wait list now going um, because we can't send every person that comes to us once again. Hi, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm from the So both can apply to the program as individuals. Um, so most of the time, what we get is one parent, um, one parent is like super interested in getting the or the other one because you know if they have children. Um, there will be one that usually has to watch the kids and try and take care of um, everything else. So we generally only get one applicant per family, but we've always been open to multiple applicants per family as well. What is your acceptance rate? Oh, um, acceptance rate really depends on the time of the year. Um.